Okay, so we're at 43 people. Welcome everybody to this session. We're still waiting for more people to join and we'll get started in a few minutes. Okay, welcome everybody. We're still waiting for people to come in, uh, but we'll get started in a minute. Let's may wait maybe one more minute and then Ton will kick this session off. Yes. Yeah, I think we can uh, we can start this session. Um, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, second session of the Geography of Sustainability Transitions webinar. Uh, we are very honored to have uh, Professor Michaela Trippel here today and as a discussant, uh, Mark Christine. And uh, my name is Tom Mela. I'm an assistant professor at Utrecht University. And before we start, one small announcement uh, from my side. Uh, that is that um, there, uh, you have to register for all the uh, individual uh, webinars that will come in the coming weeks, but you can already register for all of them now. So if you want to attend one of the webinars in the following weeks, you can already register for these webinars now. Um, for example, for the webinar uh, next week, which will be given by uh, Lakshmi Bamidipati and Uri Hansen, and as a discussant, there will be Mark Swilling. And this webinar next week will be on unpacking transnational linkages, global local encounters, and relation in sustainable energy transitions in East Africa. And um, yeah, then for the session today, I would like to uh, hand over to uh, Christian Beans, group leader at EAWAC, who will moderate this session and who will introduce the speakers. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ton. Um, it's uh, a real pleasure uh, really uh, to be able to moderate this uh, session today. Uh, I would like to welcome you also from my side and uh, in particular, I would like to welcome um, our two speakers, Michaela Trippel and uh, Marcus Stein. Now, um, I'm really looking forward to this session because we're sort of getting a snapshot of one of the fields where I think there has been most sort of vibrant and productive exchange between transition and economic geography. Uh, literatures um, happening in the past uh, few years and both of our speakers today have been really sort of key figures in uh, making this sort of interface between transition and uh, economic geography uh, literatures sort of happen and so I guess that most of you have um, already heard about uh, Michaela Trippel's work she's been a pioneer um, with this uh, new industrial path development literature also really a famous scholar in the regional innovation system um, literature and she's a full professor at the University of uh, Vienna. And she's joined today by uh, Marco Steen, who's a senior researcher at the Sintef in Norway. And he has also been involved with the work on green industrial path development for quite some time. I still remember one of the first um, special sessions we organized at an AHE conference in, uh, in, I guess it was in New York City. And Marcus was already there in the early days and then he stayed all the way up until now. So I'm looking forward very much to um, um, hearing your thoughts and also the reflections by Marcus and also um, having a, a, a stimulating Q&A. So it's the same procedure as every every week. Um, basically, we will have about 20 minutes presentation by Michaela, followed by five to max 10 minutes by Marcos with a discussion. And then the floor is open for your questions. So please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask your content questions. And if you have any other questions with technicalities and that kind of stuff, you can use the, the chat function in Zoom. So that's it uh, from my side. So without further ado, I would like to give the word to uh, Michaela. It's really great to have you here in this uh, webinar. I'm looking forward to this very much. And the virtual floor is all yours, Michaela. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. 
Many thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to give a short talk in this exciting webinar series. And thanks a lot, uh, Christian, for the uh, introduction. So I, I have been asked to uh, talk about um, uh, uneven geography of green industry emergence and growth. And I will deal with this question by dwelling on the preconditions for green path development in regions. And I will also elaborate a bit on the, on the processes and outcomes. But let me first uh, set the scene. Um, so as you know, uh, green industries have attracted a, a lot of attention in academia and also in the policy world. They clearly benefit from a, a favorable policy environment. So just think of the uh, European Green Deal or the increasing um, mission orientation or challenge orientation of uh, innovation systems and innovation system policies. And closely related to that, the proposed shift from smart specialization to, uh, to smart specialization for uh, sustainable and uh, inclusive growth. So some even argue that the uh, current uh, pandemic would uh, provide a, a window of opportunity for green industrial development in the sense of bouncing forward or even beyond, bouncing beyond. Others are more skeptical, so they argue that we can observe right now, also in the, in the context of policy recovery programs, would have little to do with um, building up capacities for transformative re resilience. It would reflect more a uh, bouncing uh, back uh, pattern. Uh, but anyway, so there is quite a hype around green industries uh, based on the assumption that they would help to reconcile environmental and uh, economic challenges. And on the one hand, there is this strong belief that uh, green industries would have a positive, Im a positive ecological impact. So not least because they uh, develop products and solutions and technologies that you know, also help to reduce carbon emissions and enhance energy efficiency, prevent the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services and so on and so forth. So uh, I will not talk about the uh, ecological impact in my presentation. We can talk about it later if you want. Just want to mention here that um, the environmental and also the social impacts of some green industries are really controversial issues. Then green industries are also often seen as a new source of economic growth and employment. So policymakers across the world have high hopes that green industries would compensate for the decline of uh, mature sectors. But as we know, this remains an unfulfilled hope in, in many places. So not all regions provide conditions for green industries to flourish. What we also need to consider, um, so when we talk about green industries and their benefits, so where do the alleged economic and ecological benefits, so where are they created? So a green industry located in a region might produce products that are applied in the same region, but it might also produce products for the global market. So the ecological benefits are created elsewhere, or a region might just import green technologies and combine it with other technologies, other solutions to support the transformation um, of its energy sector or its um, mobility sector. So I think this is important. Uh, it's important to keep this uh, in mind. But let's focus on the production side again. And as I mentioned before, there is clear evidence that regions differ quite a lot in their capacities to grow new green industries. And this is of course of key interest to, to economic geographers. So uh, why do green industries emerge in some regions and not in others? And how do green industries uh, develop over time? And as you might know, uh, many economic geographers have used the cluster approach to, to study uh, this phenomenon, so to study clean, uh, clean tech clusters. But equally interesting is what evolutionary economic geography has to offer. And one needs 
of course, to mention the literature on regional diversification in, in this regard, that this literature has shown, has this now discovered green growth as an, an, an interesting research topic, um, showing that new green uh, activities are more likely to develop in regions where related capabilities are available. And then there is the literature on what is called new path creation or new path de development. And this work offers um, broader frameworks and scholars have already begun to uh, apply them to study green industries. So uh, what I would like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to show what these more comprehensive frameworks bring into focus and what in particular um, um, the uh, recent work on what is called new regional industrial path development. So what this literature could add to our understanding of where green uh, restructuring uh, takes place. And I will single out three contributions that the new path development literature could make. So first I will argue that um, it helps us to identify different forms of green path development. So it provides a differentiated view on green restructuring. It also offers um, a broader view on the preconditions. So enabling us to get a better understanding of what constitutes a favorable environment for green industries and what constitutes a constraining environment. And finally, um, I will argue that it casts light on how multiple actors and their agency revamp the asset base that is, that is found in enabling and constraining environments. And bringing these inputs together in a framework helps to explain how the preconditions are transformed into different forms of green path development through agentic processes of asset modification. So I will develop this argument step by step, but uh, before I will uh, do so, I want to outline very briefly what um, evolutionary economic geography, so how EEG illuminates more generally what, uh, how industries emerge and grow in regions. So to keep it very short and simple, EEG tells us that new industries emerge out of favorable regional conditions, of favorable regional environment, environments of enabling conditions that um, um, are embodied in pre-existing related capabilities, in pre-existing economic and technological uh, structures. And this work provides a number of compelling conceptual arguments um, and there is also a lot of empirical evidence, but it's also fair to say that it tends to overrate uh, endogenous uh, processes and um, it provides somewhat narrow firm centered and knowledge centered uh, explanations. So, and this has led to uh, two calls for more comprehensive frameworks and there have been attempts to enrich EEG with insights from other approaches, such as the global production network approach or the technological innovation system approach, the multi-level perspective, and also the regional innovation system approach. And this has led to a number uh, of important uh, insights, I would say, for example, on the, on the complex nature of interpath relations between old industries and, and new industries. So how old industries affect new green industries in a positive way, but also in a negative way. Then a lot of work has been done on multiscalar knowledge flows and uh, more recently also on multiscalar institutional uh, dynamics, sh showing how these dynamics affect uh, green industry development in regions. And finally, um, there is a really interesting work that has shown how we could make sense of the interconnections between territorial dynamics and technological characteristics in path development processes. So I will come back to some of these findings uh, later, um, but let's move on and let's have a look on what I promised to do at the uh, beginning of this presentation. And let's start with the claim that a new path development literature would help to identify different types of uh, green um, 
restructuring of green path development. And some of you might be familiar with uh, uh, different types of topologies that have been developed. There, are, there is not one topology, there are several ones, like the one that is shown on, on this slide that proposes a distinction between path creation, diversification, importation, upgrading, extension, decline, and dissolution. So um, I will not go into detail, uh, don't worry. I would rather like to show you how this could be applied to uh, green industries and how we have done it in, in our recent work. So we kept it quite simple. We distinguished between uh, four forms and three of them, um, so path creation, importation, and diversification. They described the different ways in which uh, new green industries might emerge uh, in regions. So to begin with path creation, uh, this is defined as the rise of a, a totally new green industry resulting, for example, from groundbreaking scientific research, but there are other sources as well. Um, and a good example for green path creation could be the photovoltaic industry in Germany or the potable water reuse industry uh, in the United States. Uh, then we have green path creation, which is very different from, um, so, uh, from creation. Um, so green path importation refers to the establishment of a green industry that is new to the region resulting, for example, from the arrival of firms or inflow of skilled labor, knowledge, other assets from outside the region. So the offshore wind industry in, in Northeast England uh, would be a good example for green path importation or uh, as Christian has shown in his work on, on the water recycling sectors uh, in China, this would also be an, a good example for green path importation. And then there is green path diversification. Um, so which means that uh, a new green industry grows out uh, of pre-existing green or even brown industries. So Marcus Steen, uh, my discussion today has done some really interesting work on the uh, offshore wind industry in Norway showing how it emerged out of the oil and gas sector. And then there is also um, the greening of existing industries is also falls into the category of new green regional industrial path development, but doesn't refer to the rise of a new green industry in the region. So it's really about you know, the greening of existing industries, intra path changes uh, that uh, involve, for example, the introduction of green technologies or uh, business uh, models that introduce eco-efficient practices in mature sectors. So uh, you might critically ask, so why should this be appealing? <laughs> well, it casts light on the different ways in which green industries could emerge in regions, or let's put it like this. So regions can develop new green industries in different ways. There is not just one way. There are different forms and depending on the form, uh, rather different sources, mechanisms and actors are involved. And obviously there are also different degrees of relatedness to pre-existing uh, regional industrial structures. And I think this is also an important message to policymakers. No? So, because these different forms of green path development require very different uh, policy strategies. So, um, what are the preconditions for for green path development in regions? So, well. Um, Conventional models tell us that the pre-existing regional industrial structures uh, really matter. And this is an important uh, insight and an important message. But what does the new um, the literature on, uh, on new path development add to this? So uh, some scholars have, um, myself included, have uh, applied a regional innovation system approach. Um, and from a, a risk perspective, it's not only that pre-existing industrial structures that deserve attention, 
but also the uh, organizational support structures and the institutional configurations. So we have um, done a, a literature review on these three dimensions. And this literature review has shown that, so with regard to regional industrial structures, so that both um, pre-existing green industry and pre-existing brown industries can constitute an enabling environment for green industry emergence. So they can, they can provide a platform for opportunity-driven um, and challenge-driven development processes. And so pointing to positive inter industry relations between old and new industries. But there is also a lot of evidence that pre-existing industries can form a constraining environment due to a high degree of uh, institu institutionalization or active resistance to change and uh, competition over um, skilled workers, uh, financial assets, policy support, um, and, and markets. So, and this clearly points to negative interpath relations. Um, so, and then understanding um, regional innovation systems as open systems and uh, zooming in on uh, the non local uh, connections of regional industrial structures, we found that these inter regional connections. Um, um, can help on the one hand to prevent lock-in, so they uh, constitute uh, favorable factors, but these linkages can also be a source of lock-in. So if regions are inserted into unsustainable production and value change linkages, so they can have a um, uh, really uh, important constraining effect. So, and then there is also quite a, a lot of work that has taken stock of both the opportunities and constraints that can be found in the organizational support structures and in the institutional configuration of innovation systems. So there is work that shows how actors such as universities and uh, intermediary organizations, um, uh, financial organizations, um, so how they facilitate green path development by mobilizing knowledge assets, financial assets, uh, other assets, not only within the region, but also from higher spatial scales. So they, how they capitalize on their inter-regional linkages to support green industries in the region. Um, and at the same time, again, there is also evidence that, uh, so, organizations that make up the support structures can constrain green industries. So if they lack the capabilities or when they have vested interests in, um, uh, in brown industries and thus support uh, um, other industries. So, and then last but not least, the uh, institutional configuration. So there is also a lot of work that shows how uh, uh, formal institutions such as laws and regulations uh, and also informal institutions such as joint visions um, enable green path development. And again, a lot of evidence uh, that suggests that um, institutional uh, configurations uh, uh, do of course also constrain green industries. So just think of the regulate all the regulations and norms and subsidies that still favor brown, uh, brown industries. So there is a lot of um, evidence, I would say, uh, that it is not only the, uh, the industrial structures, but also the wider systemic uh, environment that matters when we talk about uh, initial conditions or preconditions for green path development. And perhaps more interesting than discussing all these findings from our literature review is to take a step back and to recall that uh, the system elements, so the, the firms and universities and financial organizations, intermediary organizations, um, so they can be understood as um, the, the localized structures that form and reproduce assets through a variety of system functions or 
uh, key processes, as it is called in the in the DIS literature. And here it's really important to stress that it's not only uh, knowledge and uh, and skills, but um, many more assets are involved and are required. So finan financial assets, legitimacy, and so on and, and so forth. And it's also crucial to, to emphasize that um, the structures and the assets they provide, um, so they are often well adapted to the region's current economic structure, so they um, reflect previous rounds of industrial development. And as argued before, these historically grown structures, they might either enable or constrain uh, green industries. And this leads to the question, so, well, under, under enabling conditions, so when assets are available that could be adapted to the needs of green industries, how are these opportunities and potentials transformed into green path development? And under constraining conditions, so for example, if assets are missing, so how are such barriers uh, overcome? And this requires a reconfiguration of the regional innovation system. And the crucial, crucial question um, is how do such processes take place? Uh, and one way to deal with this question is to zoom in on uh, asset modification uh, by uh, agents uh, of change. So you get about five minutes. We oui. oh, this is uh, not good, Christian. Um, so then uh, let's talk about asset uh, modification very briefly. There is an exciting work by McKinnon and colleagues, which suggests that the assets uh, we just um, uh, talked about, they can only promote new path development if they are identified, used, and, and modified. So, and this is an important argument, but this is really about uh, putting existing assets to alternative uses, to, to green uses. So it's really about redeploying and recombining uh, existing uh, regional assets. But uh, we think, and we have argued in our paper, uh, well, this, this needs to be complemented by uh, to other types of asset modification. So it's crucial uh, to look at how actors um, create new assets and how they uh, access and transplant assets from elsewhere. And equally important is how they destruct uh, old assets. Um, and then, the, so we have three uh, types of asset modifications that we think deserve uh, at attention. And uh, the relative importance of these three types of asset modification then really depends on pre-existing um, um, risk structures and, and the regional asset base. So then very briefly on, on the role of agency in asset modification. So one can, um, con, can um, build on several contributions, uh, the earlier work done by CIMI, but there is also more recent work on uh, institutional entrepreneurship, which has been uptaken in the EEG literature. The transition studies uh, literature um, has a lot to offer. So I just want to mention Musiolik's work on system builders here. Um, so there is a lot of literature on, on, on the role of agency. In our paper, um, uh, we have built on uh, uh, work done by Isaksen and Jakobsen and others. So uh, Isaksen and Jakobsen has suggested a distinction between firm level agency and system level agency. And they um, will argue that uh, both uh, firm level and system level agency are important and they need to be com uh, combined um, to, um, to facilitate green path development. So in, in respect uh, of time, I will not talk about firm level agency. I would rather like to zoom in on system level agency. So system level agency is really about uh, agents of change uh, who implement um, yeah, changes at the system level. And just to give you a, a, a taste what system level agency is about or what it could be about, 
So we have um, again done uh, a literature review and we uh, we found um, yeah, that system level agency really comes in many different forms. So there, uh, for example, uh, so a lot of evidence on, on um, implementation of new cluster projects, but also um, on the important role of, of policy actors in acting system level, system level agency in the form of um, um, also, um, supporting the creation of market, protecting new markets, but also the disruption of uh, industrial setups. So, uh, as I mentioned before, asset destruction is a, is a key thing, um, and there is also uh, quite a bit of evidence on uh, um, on the disruption of institutional setups, for example, by withdrawing subsidies from from dirty industries. But system level agency is much more than this more policy related um, uh, example shown in in this table. So it uh, includes creation of um, intermediary organization uh, adapting and um, creating uh, new educational programs and research programs. It's about changing regulation, uh, regulations and, um, and much more. So I think the message that I want to convey is that, so if we look at green path development in regions, and uh, if we address the question, uh, what, what is the role of system level agency, then we see that it is indeed multiple actors, so firms and uh, non-firm actors at multiple spatial scales who enact system level agency um, and um, um, yeah, taken together, this really has an, a huge influence on uh, green path development in regions. So Christian, do I have two more minutes? Yes, one and a half. <laughs> one and a half, okay. So then um, just a, a few words on um, what we are currently doing in, in Vienna. So what is on our current, our future research agenda. So we are currently um, uh, working hard on um, getting a better understanding of the greening of established industries so green path renewal. And so together with uh, Simon Baumgartinger, Seiringer and other colleagues, um, we have begun to uh, zoom in on also developing a stage model and we have begun to zoom in on the initiation, acceleration and consolidation of transformative activities um, uh, uh, within established paths, within mature sectors. And um, also together with uh, colleagues from uh, from Norway and, and Sebastian uh, Fastenrath, uh, a new postdoc researcher in Vienna, we are very interested in how COVID-19 uh, affects these transformative activities in mature sectors. And one thing that um, is really of key interest to us is, again, the role of agency. Uh, but not only change agency, but also what is called re reproductive agency. So there is a, a very uh, nice work by Nora Bekelund um, and others who have shown that this um, um, reproductive agency does not only have a dark side uh, in, a, in the sense of actors actively resisting change, but it is uh, also have a bright side in the sense that it uh, is really important for consolidating um, change. And then last slide, and then I stop, I promise. <laughs> uh, what's also on our agenda is um, the destabilization of, of old, of so-called dirty industries. Um, so destabilization um, as a result of COVID-19, but also as a consequence of um, um, proactive exno uh, policy exnovation strategies and an important question here is okay but uh, uh, what to do with um, the people uh, so what to do with these left behind places or left behind uh, people and uh, so we are currently working just started um, a, a new project that seeks to better understand how to build up capacities for transformative uh, resilience under such conditions. Um, and we will also zoom in a bit on the role of 
of uh, uh, S4 plus uh, in this regard. Okay, then I stop here. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to Marcus' uh, question and comments. So thanks a lot, Michaela, for a really inspiring, interesting talk. So Marcus, if you could stick to five minutes, uh, raise the most important points, it would be really nice. Only five minutes. I'll give it a go. Okay. So, um... Yes, okay, well, um, I'll try to be brief. Um, thanks a lot for this invitation to comment on this very inspirational presentation by um, Michaela. And so what I want to do now is to, to comment, um, at, well, obviously on the presentation and the papers um, that this presentation was based on, but I also want to make some comments that I think are maybe more generally related to this um, bridging work that's going on between uh, especially path development research in economic geography and the field of sustainability transition. So obviously there's a lot of potential and so on, but I, um, I do think there are some things we need to think about. Um, so anyway, so uh, Michaela, I'm here as a, as a critical friend, um, just so you know that. So. So I have a few discussion points that I wanted to raise. And the first one is sort of sort of about semantics, right? So, so you talk about green path development. I've done the same. Uh, we talk about green growth and so on, but I, th I think it is a bit problematic, right? And, and you know, what is a green path really? And how do we define, uh, how do we define that? How do we know one when we see one? It's also problematic. I think this dichotomy with green and brown or clean and dirty, right? And so it becomes quite difficult, especially if you look at industries from more from a value chain perspective, right? It, right? It's very easy to see that something that is green within one industry, right, has is attached to a value chain or production network that has a very dirty upstream um, component, right? For example, in, in mining or some big, big problem downstream with, with waste generation, for example, from what we're seeing happening now with solar PV panels, for example. So obviously there's work to, to, to get around that, but it's kind of, it's a more messy. And I think there's that kind of continuum from green to brown. Um, and, and, and there is kind of, we're kind of using this, this, this is also obviously terms that are very popular with policymakers, right? And I think, you know, I see a lot of examples of, of also of industry actors um, talking about their industries as being green or not. Uh, a sort of a, a, an extreme case is this recent initiative here in my region in Trendelag, uh, this initiative to develop a green petroleum cluster, which is kind of just at the end of the day, it's quite bizarre in a way. Right, so I'm wondering if we need to think about, you know, what kinds of concepts we use or terms to to say something about the sustainability of, of sectors. All right, so, and th there's also the other side of this, right? So whatever we would then define as, as being brown or dirty, I think, I mean, some of them, they are really critical. They are important for our societies, right? Um, and they're important for many of the green sectors, right? So they provide whatever, steel, cement, chemicals, um, we can't sort of live without them. They'll be around, and I'm I'm wondering if it's sort of, sort of almost morally right to simply denote them as dirty. So that's kind of something I think we need to think about. Then I think there's a this thinking going to the like the 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 framework that you present in 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 the paper. I, I really wonder if you know the if green path development really is very different from any other type of non-colored path. Development, right? So, so you point at sort of many of the same sort of basic um, dimensions in the framework. So it's about asset modification, about different agentic processes, firm and system level, institutional change, and so on. But I think there's kind of there's something. What about green path development? I'm wondering. I'm thinking there's something about uh, uh, there's a contingent contingency here with changes in social technical systems, or um, there's that coevolution with the green path development in a region and a social technical system that it's somehow part of. So there's something about that. And that kind of links on to a question I have about the, the limits to this kind of regional innovation system inspired approach to understanding green industrial change, right? So to me, it's kind of, I know you pointed the sort of multi-scalar issues, um, the extra local dynamics, but at the end of the day, it's 
sort of contain, a containerized view of industrial change uh, to be uh, more critical than I really am. And I think that there's really something about, for example, policy and the role of national and national policy to allow for some of these new green industries that I think sort of needs to be integrated here. Um, and then there's also obviously this kind of this um, this, this sort of negative implication of green path development that we see, right? That, you know, when, when greening occurs in one region, it's sort of the other side of that coin is that there's a, a sort of a, 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 a brown part of that. The brown part is, is transplanted elsewhere. It's offshored or outsourced often to, you know, countries with more lax environmental regulation and so on. So that's, it's, this is also part of the story, which kind of calling for, I guess, a broader perspective on these green path development processes. And I think this also connects with uh, with the whole debate now in transitions, which I think is really important. And where I think economic geography has a lot to offer is about the whole issue about just transitions. And you kind of raised that on your final slide, right? So what are the implications of these changes, right? And the, the types of resistance we're seeing many places towards new green industries or technologies because people's livelihoods are affected um, and, the, and the uneven development implications of, of this kind of greening, right? There's a lot of work, obviously, um, uh, in other places also, this work by Jennifer Barca on, from, I think, more kind of a political ecology perspective on biofuels in, in southern India is, um, is very interesting in that regard. And then this is kind of more um, more related to how we conceptually think across economic geography around path development and within sustainability transition. So it's really a question of what is it we're what is it kind of we're studying, right? And and in economic geography, at least the, the part of economic geography that that we represent, it's about sort of at the end of the day, it's about regional regional change. We, industrial structures and how they change and so on whereas in transitions research it's more about these social technical systems so i'm wondering if you could comment on what you think how you think about this relationship there between these regional industries and social technical systems i'm wondering if you know how should we think about them as sort of the, the production side of social technical regimes or are there other ways of thinking about that and I think the ways we think about this has implications for how we also need to consider sort of multi-scalar issues and multi-sectoral issues and, and, and multi-regional issues. So it's kind of, it influences a lot how we sort of define the scope of what we try to, to understand and make sense of. And then I think a, a final point is kind of being coming from economic geography and into this then dialogue with sustainability transitions. I think this, this kind of path development um, research that I've also uh, sort of been part of over the last years, um, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. And I think it's, it's been very important and, and contributed a lot to, to our field in economic geography. But there's also, what I see is this kind of, um, this kind of conceptual fuzziness that has in some ways emerged. So since the, I, will, I would consider the kind of the really seminal paper here by, by Ron Martin and Peter Sundley back in 2006, where they talked about sort of non-constraining path dependent uh, um, uh, regional evolution and how sort of we, we don't have to go into decline. We don't, it doesn't have to be that rigid, you know, industries and regional structures can change in via different mechanisms. And that's been taken up by, by various authors so just some examples here. So there, there are lots of different uh, path development concepts. And sometimes so those concepts are sort of um, uh, dissimilar concepts are used to denote more or less the same phenomena. But other times the same concept is used to denote something quite different. So there's that kind of conceptual fuzziness that I'm wondering when we, when we now more and more maybe enter into this dialogue with sustainability transition researchers or or people from other fields if we need to on our side be a bit more clear on 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 our conceptualization so that's what i had i hope uh, i didn't spend too much time thanks a lot marcus for raising these points really interesting sort of um, you know kickoff for the q and a so i would suggest that we jump right in with questions you know that came up in your presentation and also sort of in the q and a by the general audience 
And the first question I would like to point in your direction, Michaela, is was also asked by Lars Kuhnen, um, you know, where the green path development is essentially different from other regional industrial development path. And then also the follow-up question, so could you apply the same conceptual framework to other transitions, for example, with artificial intelligence, digitalization, and so on? What's your reflections on this point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, very simple questions. <laughs> so, uh, thanks a lot also to, to, to Marcus. I, 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 I really like these questions, but it's uh, so not all of them are, uh, it's not that easy to answer all of them in a, in, in a satisfactory way. So how do, uh, first question, Christian, uh, how do uh, green, uh, how does green path development differ from uh, other types of green path development? It was also a question that was raised by by um, by Marcus, and I'm. It's not the first time that I get this question, and I'm always struggling a bit with um, coming up with a good answer because, um, uh, it, in a way, the question suggests that there are green industries and they are. Uh, homogeneous group and then there are the ordinary industries and they are also a homogeneous group and I I, I think this is um, so we are oversimplifying things a bit uh, but I don't want to shy away from an answer so, um, so, so I think when we compare green industrial path development with uh, path development in, in other industries I think what what could be an an important difference is that in, in green industrial path development, there are um, yeah, as a more a larger set of more heterogeneous actors are involved or have an influence. So it's not the no, the, um, the the classic triple helix constellation that really plays a role, but the the set of actors is is more diverse. Let's put it like this. So I don't, this, I don't mean that all of them are actively actively involved in developing a green industry, but they have at least an influence. So just think of the uh, social uh, as of, of 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 societal actors. And another difference, another difference could be that. Um, I, you know this this innovation exnovation relationship um, um, is more pronounced in green industry development and that also that policy has a stronger role in shaping innovation exnovation relationships and dynamics so i think this yeah this this i would say this, these are two differences that come to my mind when we compare green industrial path development to what you call ordinary uh, ordinary um, path development. So path development going on in the video games industry or in the ICT industry or in the software industry or whatever. Thanks a lot. Um, there's maybe a related question a little bit, which is about interpath sort of relationships by Amir uh, Piru Sabadi, who is asking about this. So also in green sectors, often you have different technology sectors that interact in the path development process. So how would you approach that? And also with the different types you know, of path development that you've talked about, renewal, um, reconfiguration, path creation, you know, how to deal with this sort of complexity? Uh, so can, uh, can you repeat it? So then- About the path- You so might get the question. <laughs> the question is about, um, uh, the interpath relationships in these path development um, sort of mm. processes, you know, when different industries, sectors have to interact, especially in green sectors, we see this quite often. Um, how would you approach this, you know, interpath, cross path interactions? Mm. In the framework? Yeah, I think we, we um, have done a paper on that, so I would be very happy to forward it to um, Amir. So, um, this is true. So this is indeed a, a very complex, no? um, and but it, it's not only it's not only about this uh, 
positive interpath relations, as it is suggested by the question. I think what's equally interesting are the uh, the, no, the, the, the negative uh, interpath uh, relations or interpath conflicts between green industries and other green industries and um, brown industries. So um, I think this is what what uh, is is really important, not because there are not only synergy potentials between different industries or that no, other industries having a positive effect on on green industries. There are also this, as I try to explain, these negative forms of interpath relations, which then no, really bring into focus, uh, um, yeah, so conflicts over um, over assets and uh, competition over markets and so on and so forth. So, I in in my view, this is there. There isn't too much work on these interpath relations. I regret to say that there are only a few papers out there, but in my view, this is um, um, a really promising research area. So, uh, better understand both the, the positive interpath dynamics and the negative ones. Thanks a lot for that. There's another cluster of very simple answers uh, for you about agency and how you conceptualize uh, agency. Uh, the first one is by Wolfgang Heider, who's asking whether we need a sort of a mid-range theory to understand and analyze, you know, the agency that's, you know, you know involved in asset modification um, processes, for example. Um, and there's a related question by Hui Wengong, who's asking whether uh, maybe looking more into organizational change at sort of a more micro level could help to then uh, derive from that better understanding about meso and sort of macro structures, how they change. So would a look into organizational management literature maybe help to better understand and conceptualize agency in your framework? Yes, uh, so who event you're cordially invited to, to do such a paper together with me and my colleagues in Vienna. So, <laughs> yeah, mid-range, I'm, I'm not sure. So I think what, so as I, I try to ex explain that at the end of my presentation, I think what uh, what's, what's really interesting is not to, to overcome this, this strong bias on uh, change agents, so, and I think there is now a lot of literature out there and uh, also EEG has um, done a lot over, over the past few years to integrate an agency perspective into the uh, path development discussion. Um, and this is fine. And we have uh, uh, learned a lot from the institutional entrepreneurship literature and uh, other literatures, but I think what's, re what's really important and. Uh, try to explain that is to, as to, uh, to complement that by, um, by studies, that all, studies that also look into what is called maintenance agency or, or um, reproductive agency, because uh, we, we also, we, we talk so much, you know, also in, in, also in relation to, to green industries, but also uh, transitions of, uh, of socio-technical systems, we talk a lot about how to in initiate these things, but the key question is really how to accelerate huh? um, these, these developments and how to consolidate them. And this is where um, huh? this um, re reproductive agency comes into play. And I think what, what is really urgently needed is to get a better understanding huh? how agents um, how agents consolidate uh, change, how they strengthen paths, how they accelerate sustainability transitions. I think this is high in demand uh, and um, at least in economic geography, not, not very well understood, I would say. Thanks for that. Maybe I'd like to come back also to the point that was raised by Marcus at the end about conceptual sort of fuzziness or the different, you know, typologies that are out there. And there was also a related question uh, by Emil Evenhuis about, um, you know, what this means when you have this sort of uh, really nice holistic perspective, but at the same time you have some conceptual fuzziness. So how do you translate it and also into usable sort of policy implications? What's your perspective? Maybe on one hand side about the challenges in connecting to transitions with this complexity that's in the room, and also what the implications are for policy making. 
Mm. Yes, um, so I am of course well aware of ne, the different typologies that um, have been developed and I uh, have also contributed <laughs> a bit to these different uh, typologies. And I do understand that ne, so this different, having different typologies, uh, that this might create some confusion. Um, on the other hand, I am a bit... Uh, more rel relaxed than uh, than Marcus or or Emil because uh, I mean it it just reflects na, a continuous development of these typologies huh? uh, and this is what we are supposed to do as scientists na? there is a typology and then we work with it and we realize okay this uh, doesn't really work or uh, not everything is covered so we develop them further so um, I'm. I'm more relaxed uh, on that, but um, uh, on the other hand, I do understand that this has uh, created confusion and also in empirical applications. No? As a, you, you cannot always, uh, you have to be pragmatic. You cannot always no? investigate all potential types of, of path development that are uh, suggested by con conceptual work. Um, um, so then you have to be pragmatic and say, okay, I don't look at path dissolution or I don't look at niche development or whatever, but no, given the time constraints or financial constraints in project, you, no, you zoom in on uh, um, a few of them. So, but again, I do understand that this has created confusion and yeah, I, I, I would be very happy if, no, uh, so to have a standard paper on that, uh, and uh, any, uh, so if uh, Christian, you or Marcus are interested in developing such a, a, a standard paper on the path types, then let me know. Uh, let's join forces and let's do that. I think I contributed to the confusion too, my <laughs> writing a little bit. So. But anyways, so uh, there's a, another question which also relates to the dark sides of in, uh, green industrial path development that Marcus was alluding to a little bit by Bruno Turnheim, who asks, you know, about your last point with the destabilization and path renewal. Um, so you said that you focus on uh, sort of transformative resilience. So how will you do this? And also, you know, isn't this sort of optimistic? Um, so doesn't destabilization also mean you know, with actually decline and also dissolution then of certain paths and regions, which has a lot of, of negative consequences, of course. What, what's your perspective, how to approach this? Yes, and this is exactly the challenge we are facing, right? So we, I mean, there, uh, and there, are, so <laughs> the, I think the key thing is really not to, to accelerate, to accelerate, um, sustainability transition process and also accelerate the uh, development of green industries, which are part of, of this process. So you, um, and the question is really how to, how to do that. Uh, and we know that uh, as a focusing only on, on innovation is not enough. So I think there are tons of papers that really demonstrate that this isn't enough. So, um, and that, uh, what is needed as a, let's say, complementary process is path destabilization or exnovation, as it is also called. And of course, this create, creates a, lo <laughs> a lot of problems. No? So on my last slide, I think I, I, I try to show that um, no, this comes with economic consequences, with social consequences, with enormous political consequences. No? So the, just think of the... Uh, the um, the right-wing parties that are not really gaining in importance in, in Europe and in the United States and elsewhere. So this is exactly the, the key challenge. And I think Bruno Dornheim, I mean, uh, he's, an, he's an expert on path destabilization and, and on, on, on exnovation and so written so many interesting papers now why, why this is important. But it creates challenges and it indeed forces us to, to think about ne, um, what is called uh, trans, transformative resilience uh, and what is also covered by this proposed shift from smart spec to smart specialization for 
uh, not only sustainable growth, but also uh, in inclusive growth. And um, what we are currently doing, so together with uh, 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 Sebastian Fastenrath and, and, and other colleagues is really, uh, uh, so try to understand and also work with uh, policy actors uh, in the region. Uh, so how <laughs> structural change that is, unavoidable when we talk about acceleration and, uh, and, and exnovation path destabilization, uh, how the, the structural change um, that is necessary can be, let's put it uh, like this, directed into more just and uh, green forms of, of development. And this doesn't, <laughs> this doesn't really work out in all types of regions. No? So in some, it works quite well. You can reopen some, no? some industrial sites and try to turn that into a, a greener direction, but uh, it doesn't work in, 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 in all regions. And this is a, a big challenge. So I do not really have a, a, a good answer here for this, <laughs> not yet. So, um, let us first do us our research <laughs> in in one year or two years and can can talk about it again. So thanks a lot, uh, Michaela, for these uh, answers. So we can meet again in two years in the next webinar <laughs> session. No, but I want to really thank uh, you for, for your insights and everybody for the great questions. I think, uh, you know, what has come out from the presentation and the Q&A is that this is a sort of a really generative conceptual interface. Um, and that there's actually a lot of exciting ground that's still really open to be explored in, in, in this field. So um, yes, basically everybody's invited to contribute uh, to uh, uh, this sort of thinking and, and advancing the agenda in this field. So um, thanks a lot to both um, speakers. Thanks a lot for all your inputs uh, in today's session. And we'd like to close this here and we hopefully will meet again um, next week and in the weeks after in the, the upcoming webinars. So thanks again and um, have a nice rest of the day or evening or morning, wherever you are. See you soon. Thanks a lot. See you.